the book of Ruth, if you would, the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 1, where we continue our series on lessons from a repentant backslider. We're trying to answer the question, can a believer backslide? We're going to look at one we did last week. I'd like to look at uh, the book of Ruth, chapter 1 and verse 20. Let's, let's hear from the confession of a backslider. Call me not Naomi. Now, Naomi means pleasant. But call me Mara. Mara means bitter. For the Almighty, El Shaddai, hath dealt very bitterly with me. We've seen that sin hardens. Sin blinds. Sin deadens our spiritual appetites. Sin damages. And sin has consequences. Sin affects us as well as others. And here we see one such person down in Moab as she is seeking to return a bitter, hard, indifferent, cold individual. And that's what sin will do to you. But praise God that Naomi decided to go back. To go back. I'm thankful that God, like the prodigal son's father, you remember, stands with open arms, ready to receive his children back. We can go into the depths of sin and disobedience like Jonah who prayed from the belly of the whale. I've seen many a Christian in the belly of a whale. But God is waiting with open arms to receive His children back. The Bible says, Whom the Lord loves, He chastens. That's how I know I'm one of His children. I can't sin and get by with it. If I do, the Bible says, then we're not His children. Because if, if I'm a child of God, He's going to chasten me. Amen. He knows where I live. He knows my email address. He knows my phone number. God knows everything about me. You talk about the government knowing all about you? God knows all about His children. And He reached out to Naomi. We saw her plight following her disobedient husband, Elimelech, God is king, decides to go down to Moab in a famine, in a hard time. He leaves Bethlehem, the house of bread, of Judah, of praise, of Ephrata, that means fruitful. And for ten years he goes down there, and somewhere along the line, things go from bad to worse. We never see an effort of Elimelech to get right with God and to go back. He dies in disobedience. Kind of reminds you of Samson, doesn't it? He died in disobedience. But sad to say, his wife followed him. She chose to go with him. She remained in Moab. You don't have to follow your spouse or your relatives or even your friends into sin getting out of church, quit reading your Bible, quit uh, doing the things you should do. You get in, yes, to drink and to drugs and to evil, and you just fall them right on into sin. Moab was a sinful place, we found out. The chief god of the Moabites was Chemosh, who was a cruel god like many of the evil Canaanites, Molech, Ashtaroth, these gods had human sacrifices. And they would give their children to these heathen gods. And what is sad, we read the book of Jeremiah and see that God's people got involved in that wickedness. God's people. The Mosaic Law said that the Moabites were to be forbidden to share in the worship to the tenth generation. 
But we see Elimelech, as we have seen, was a backslider. Backsliders rarely pay much heed to the Word of God, even when they know its fact and the precepts of their heart, they choose to disobey. So uh, she allows her son down in Moab to marry these Moabite girls. They're unsaved as well. Uh, and she is backslidden. I made the statement, the longer you're disobedient or backslidden or in the world, the more carnal seed that you plant. And I've often said the more self has control of your life, like a car out of control, uh, the more damage you do to your life and to others. She becomes a bitter, could we say, blind, hardened, and indifferent. Hebrews warns us, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. She says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. And what do backslidden, bitter, and indifferent people do? They blame God. And that's what she's doing. She would dare say, the Almighty El Shaddai, the All-Sufficient One, has dealt very bitterly with me. And again, we could ask ourselves, what are you angry with God about? Your health? Your family, your job, things didn't work out like you thought. I've run across many of many a believer. Now, I'm not talking about unsaved people that have gotten bitter and angry and upset with God because life didn't turn out like they thought. It may be of your own doing, like Elimelech and Naomi, or it may be not of your own doing, like Job. But needless to say. Life is filled with problems. Again, her husband is dead, her children are dead, her children are dead, her daughters in law are no help because they're heathen. She has no grandchildren after ten years. She's a widow now. But she finally has had enough. And could I say that's often the way it is with a the backslider? They, they don't have, they hadn't had enough yet. Maybe you got a backslidden family member or friend or someone you know and they're just cold and indifferent. Well, they hadn't had enough yet. The Bible says, Whom the Lord loves, He chastens and He scourges every son whom He receiveth. That's a pretty harsh word, that word scourging. So what is her plan now? She says, well, I'm deciding to go back. I'm deciding to go back. She returns. You see, backsl backsliding is a choice, and so is revival. Repentance is a change of mind. So she decides to say, you know what? I've had enough of this sin. I've had enough of this life. And Naomi's heart had a deep desire to return to the house of bread and praise and go back to the fellowship of the people of God, one commentator said. So notice as we look at chapter 3 real quick, uh, what does she do? Uh, she uh, has a desire to say, well, uh, girls, you go back to your gods. In other words, bad advice from a backslider. Can you imagine that? She's telling Ruth and Orpah, go back to Molech. Go back to your heathen gods and your heathen family and your wicked life. Just go back. What bad spiritual advice. What bad social advice. And of course she gives this big old long spiel about, well, I don't have any sons and if I got married today and would, and would have a son and raise him, you'd be too old. What bad advice! Like the most important thing in these girls' lives is to get married. That's not the most important thing in your life. Again, someone said she talked to them about getting married as if that was all the important goal in life. You know what was most important? Jehovah God is what will make you happy and joyful as a believer, 
not going back to Moab to get married. Jehovah El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. The old song that we sing. She was a sad influence. And that's what happens to us when we're backslidden. But thank God, there was one daughter-in-law that said, well, I'm not going back. Isn't, isn't it something that even a Christian in a backslidden state can still have a little bit of testimony? And praise God that Naomi decides, I'm going back. But let's look today at her place, her journey back. Her journey back. So they went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, in verse 19, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? Is this Naomi? Where, where does uh, a backslider start? He starts with repentance. He looks at his life. He looks at his sin. He looks at his state. And he says, I've had enough of this life. I'm turning back to God. Remember the prodigal said, I'm going home where I belong. And Naomi said, I'm going back to the house of bread. I'm going back. Let me say that her bitterness, her hardness, and her indifference was a journey. And so is your journey back to God. You can come down this morning and repent on your knees and get right with God. But let me tell you, that's just the first step. That's just the first step. You didn't get way out there and, and, and away from God by one step. Neither uh, are you going to get back and right with God by one step. Now you've got to make that first step. And she did. As she returned. David said, renew a right spirit within me. He said, Lord, change my attitude. Change my attitude about my life, about sin, and about you. He said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. So there are some truths about Naomi's journey. Could we look at them real quick? First of all, her journey back began with her fellowship. Her fellowship. Again, uh, John Phillips points out the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Here's what he said. In the Old Testament, all the blessings were connected with a place in the land of Canaan. In the New Testament, the blessings are connected with a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, uh, everything had to be done being in the land. In the New Testament, everything has to be done with being in the Lord. In the Old Testament, the Jew moved out of the land, was out of place of blessing and fellowship. For you remember, God was in Jerusalem, in the temple. The glory of God dwelt there. But in the New Testament, God dwells in His people, not in a building. And that fellowship can be broken by sin in our lives. And the Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And when you and I walk off into the world and choose to live our own lives, then it grieves the Holy Spirit who lives within us because we've walking, walked away from God. And that's what Naomi did. But you know what? She says, I want back in fellowship with Jehovah. And John would tell us in 1 John 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now that's in salvation. But that's also in service and sanctification as we walk a holy and a separated life. But what happens? Sin can come in. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves 
and the truth is not in us. And oh, as we've said to the children, we need the, the Christian's bar of soap. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, the word confess in the Greek means to speak the same as. You see, we've quit rationalizing. We've, we've quit excusing ourselves. We've quit explaining it away. And we've said, God, I need to get right with you. And I want to get back in fellowship. Again, John would tell us a little bit later in 1 John when he says, uh, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He said, The world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, what is fellowship? John talked about the fellowship. Walking in the light. Fellowship is the word quantania. It means things that we have in common. Oh, we have in common with the brothers and sisters in Christ. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, the preaching, uh, things that we love and share uh, alike. Those are things that we have in common. We want to give to missions. We want to see the church grow and see people saved. And Oh, what a blessing. But when we walk away from all of that and we'd rather have fellowship with the world, the evil of the world, the sin of the world, the wickedness of the world, we'd rather hug the world and have fellowship with the world. That's what happened to Naomi. And what did it do? It left her bitter, hard, and indifferent. But you know what she said? She said, I went out full and it brought me home empty. And that's what the backsliding life does. Oh, you thought your friends are getting drunk and doing drugs and any morality. Oh, oh, that's going to be fun. And then you start reaping what you sown. You're messing up your life, your body, your mind. And like the prodigal son in the pig pen with the hogs. The longer self has control, the more damage he does. Returning means you want your fellowship with God restored. Repenting of your sin is just the beginning to restoring the damage that you have done in your life. And she says, Lord, I want to come home. It's no wonder that Paul would tell us in Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and verse 11, very powerful truth, when he said, Have no fellowship. Fellowship with the unfruitful works of righteousness. But it happens, doesn't it? It may be a decision you made to say, I'm going I'm to... You see, repentance is a change. When we don't want to make a change, we're not really repentant. But we want to make a change and say, I'm going to get back in church. I'm going to start reading my Bible again. I'm going to start tithing and, and worshiping God. And I'm going to make my heart sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And, and when the pastor rebukes me or, or godly people rebuke me, I'm going to listen. And Lord, I'm going to start uh, singing and rejoicing and praising you. There's a change. It's not that we do it, but godly sorrow worketh repentance. And oftentimes, Christians are just sorry they got caught. They're not sorry toward God and their sin. Amen. And that's the difference. Repentance. Godly sorrow works repentance. Praise God for a God that receives repentant sons and daughters. And when we come back, He's there with open arms. And he says, where have you been? El Shaddai has been here all along. And that's where we see the name El Shaddai. You know where you find it most? In the book of Job. Here's a man that lost his family, lost his farm, lost his health. And he says, though the Almighty slay me, I will trust in Him. And Satan came to him and said, God doesn't care about you. Look at all this evil that's come upon you. You lost your family, lost your farm, lost your health. 
And his own wife said, Curse God and die. And he said, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No, Naomi, God hadn't dealt bitterly with you. It's you. It's you! It's gotten bitter toward life and God and everything else. But praise God for a God. Her fellowship was changed. She's gone back to the house of bread, the praise of fruitfulness. Notice her, her fruitfulness, whose fruit begins. What does the Bible say? Fruit meant for repentance. One daughter-in-law returns with her. And look, if you would, in chapter 2, in verse 3. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now let me tell you, Ruth had no idea who Elimelech was. She didn't know Naomi's relatives. She just happened to step foot. Isn't it good to know that when we, when we make a step toward God, God begins to put our life back together. There was an old song years ago they used to sing, Broken Pieces. Take your broken pieces and lay them at the Savior's feet. And that's what Naomi's doing. Could we say she's back in church? She's back to praying. She's stepping back and things are getting better. Oh, it was a journey into darkness, but now it's a journey into light. And then one day that Ruth comes home, look in chapter 2, if you would. And uh, you remember the story I love at verse 16, when uh, Boaz is looking over to his men, and uh, he walks up to his uh, steward and he says, See that Moabite girl? When you're reaping the fields, just drop a little bit on purpose. What, boss? I said, drop a little bit on purpose. And he walks away. And I can see that guy, you know, he's just, he's gleaning up the weed and he picks up a handful and he kind of <clears throat> drops a little bit. And he picks up another handful, you know, and he kind of drops a little bit. And, and Ruth is there in the field and she's gleaming. That's what poor people do. That's God's uh, uh, work program. You know, the poor had to work for what they could get. And, and that was a blessing if they were physically able. And uh, so she's gleaning all this. She's picking up all this. It's, and she comes home. And she walks into the home and uh, her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law whom she had wrought and said, The man's name whom I walled in the field today is... And Naomi's saying, All this, all this, uh, what a blessing. And she says, His name is Boaz. And Naomi goes, Huh? Boaz! Isn't it a blessing when you get right with God? You take a step and God begins to work in your life. He begins healing your soul. That bitter spirit and that unhappiness. and Oh, but when you start getting right with God, oh, the Lord is merciful and gracious. And uh, we know the story. Ruth begins to make contact with Boaz and he seems to be interested. Chapter 3 closes out. And when Naomi says, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be at rest until he have finished the thing this day. Our things are getting better. You see, that's what happens when you make a step toward God. I've seen many a teenager walk away from God and church and get angry. I've seen moms and dads and families walk away from God and if something happened in their life and sin has pulled them, disobedience, whatever it is, uh, a wife following a husband into sin or a husband following the wife and they both get out and their family's a mess. Oh, but when they decide to get back, how God begins to work and there's fruit for goodness now. It shows you the mercy and the forgiveness of God. Amen. We know the rest of the story, don't we? That Ruth and Boaz get married. 
And the Bible says in verse 14 of chapter 4, And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. Of course, verse 13 says, Boaz and Ruth, um, when he went in unto her, she gave conception and she, she bare a son. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. Isn't that beautiful? God has a way of restoring the years that the locust hath eaten. He's a loving, caring, forgiving God that is delighted when His children repent and come back and say, Lord, I want it right. And aren't you glad that the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time? Oh, aren't you glad that Mark didn't stay in disobedience, but he came back and, John, and Paul would say of him, and bring Mark, for he's profitable to me to the ministry. It doesn't have to end that way like Elimelech. But let me call your attention to her fragrance. Her fellowship, her fruit, and now the fragrance. So listen to what these ladies say. In verse 17, For the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. And these are the generations of Perez, and Perez beget Hezron, and Hezron beget Ram, and Ram beget Abinadab, Abinadab beget Nashon, and Nashon beget Salmon, and Salmon beget Boaz, and Boaz beget Obed. Now, I want you to follow with me now. You walk into Naomi's home. She's sitting in her rocking chair and she's holding a little baby boy and the women they're all coming and Naomi can you see this this grandma she her just smiling and beaming where's all that bitterness now God has restored to her life all oh, that pleasant tree is back all that godly influence among the ladies is back. She's back to being that pleasant Naomi, sweet and godly. She wasn't always that way. Isn't it interesting in the book of Ruth, who we know Ruth wrote, she, ref she doesn't refer to Naomi as Mara, but just that one place. She calls her Naomi. And she's smiling and said, so, what are we going to call the baby? And the women said, call him Obed. Now what, what does Obed mean? Obed means a worshiper. What a change from bitterness to pleasant. And there she is. El Shaddai, the God of all sufficiency. Aren't you glad that God restores? Someone said, so then Naomi had her fragrance restored. Instead of shedding gloom everywhere she went, now she sheds gladness, a fragrance. People notice the joy of the Lord in her life. I'm glad God restores backsliders, aren't you? I'm glad God loves His children. If you're not saved, you need to know Jehovah El Shaddai, the God of all sufficiency. Her fellowship with El Shaddai has now been restored. And we see that uh, her fruit is bearing, touching the other ladies, touching... Ruth and Boaz and raising little Obed to serve God and serve the Lord and he would be in the Messianic line. And what a fragrance. 
Let me close with this verse, Hebrews 13 and verse 15. By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. A number of years ago, when we went to our church in Thomaston, there was a couple that lived right down the street from us. And we got to know them, and we found out they were church members, former church members. I went to visit them one day and invite them just really back to church, see what was going on. And the story was they had two sons, and the one son went off to Tennessee Temple and maybe took a few classes. I don't think he graduated, but he came back and he got cancer and he died. And, and this was their son that they thought maybe was going to be in the ministry, was going to serve God and do wonderful things, maybe be a missionary, I don't know what all. And, but he died. They had another son, but this couple got bitter. I began to ask the church people, I said, you know this couple? Yeah, yeah. They used to be so faithful in church. Their children, they came involved, serving. They hadn't been in years. Hadn't been in years. And as I walked around with them at their home, it was sad. They still had their son's car in the driveway. They had their son's bedroom just like he had left it. And they had all his books. I thought it was kind of spooky. I thought, how long has this guy been dead? Uh, you know, it's been years. And, and, uh, but they had gotten bitter and angry at God. As I began to try to talk with them and share the Word of God with them, their bitterness and their anger began to melt away. And they started coming back to church. And I could see the joy of the Lord getting back into their hearts and their lives. One day I went to visit them. I think they were sick. And she, she took me into her son's room and she began to take books off the shelf. I recognized some of the books. I had not long been out of Tennessee Temple myself. And she brought them over to me. And she said, Pastor, you can have these books. I knew the joy of the Lord was back in their lives. You too can have that joy. You see, the journey into sin begins with a choice. It may be a child, a teenager, a mom or a dad or a grandma. It may be whoever. But it's a choice that we make. But you know what? The decision to come back and to say, Lord, there's something in my life that I need to let go of and I need to turn from is called repentance. And maybe today you need to repent. And you need... It's a journey. You can come down here and pray, and that's, that's, a, that's just the first step. You can pray right where you are. That's just the first step. But maybe there's friends that you got you need to get rid of. The things you're watching or doing or acting, you got a bad attitude, you need to start right now. But you're not going to change it overnight. It's a journey back to God. And would you start it now? Would you bow with me in prayer? Do you know Him as your Savior? Do you know Him as El Shaddai, the God of all comfort? Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. What a wonderful truth. But maybe today God is calling you like Naomi to say, come back. Well, what is it that you need to forsake? I don't know. What is it that you're doing down in Moab? I don't know. You can come and sit and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, and go out in the world and sing, Oh, how I love the world. Uh, you can't have fellowship. God says you can't serve God and man. You got to have fellowship. You got to let the world go. James calls us spiritual adulteresses and adulterers. You can't go hugging on the world and then come to church and hug on Jesus. Oh, James says that's not going to happen. Is it God sees through all that phoniness? But maybe today God has pricked your heart and this could be a journey back. I don't know. 
But I pray that you'd make a decision today. It may be just a little slip here and a little slip there. And you say, hey, I, I, I'm headed down to Moab. I need to make some corrections with our heads bowed. And would they play softly before we sing? Is there someone to say, Pastor, I, I, I'm not asking how far down in Moab you are, but I'm asking you to make some changes. And you want to you make it right. You may like David to say, Lord, renew a right spirit within me. It starts with your attitude. Is there anyone with their heads bowed? Nobody's looking. It may be little, it may be big. I don't know. I don't know what goes on in your home. I don't know what goes in the secret places of your life. I don't know what goes on when nobody's looking, but God does. And maybe there's somebody say, Pastor, I, I need to make some changes. Would you pray for me to make those changes? God bless you. Any other hands? God bless you. Any other hands? God bless you. Your hands? God bless you. Raise it up and put it down. God bless you. Lord, there are hearts and lives and hands you see. Oh, we can fool the pastor, we can fool people, but you can't fool God. And would there be some changes today? Would there be a journey back? A journey back to Bethlehem. And I pray that you would work through the power of the Holy Spirit. It begins, as James says, receive with meekness. That's an attitude the engrafted Word. Now, Lord, I don't know what needs to change, but You do. Maybe some of these need to come to the altar. I don't know. But would they listen to Your voice and say, come back to Bethlehem? Thank God that You restore backsliders. We can be this sweet, precious teenager or grandma or granddad or, or even parent that we used to be. We used to be a Naomi. Give us that back, Lord. Thank You for that promise. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive. Lord, do some cleansing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand with our heads.